So I'm going to hit record. And um, so today we're continuing on in our journey of inventory. Today we're going to do a bit of a bigger recap, right? We're going to do a, a more detailed recap because this is going to be the last recap that we're actually going to do for inventory uh, because tomorrow we're just doing an example and that's probably going to take us the entire period. We won't have time for a recap. So today we'll do a detailed recap and have a look at, at where we've been in our journey. Um, the first uh, sort of thing that we started off with when we started talking about um, inventory was we discussed the um, definition of an asset, right? You, you guys would remember we, we looked back at the conceptual framework and we said, um, you know, it's a resource controlled by the entity as a result of a past event um, and that uh, it, it would lead to future inflows, economic inflows uh, to the company, right? And we talked, so, so, so when, we, when we looked at that definition, we said, you know, is, is inventory a, a resource? Yes, it's definitely a resource, right? And then we said uh, past event was the purchase of the inventory or the uh, acquisition of the inventory. Um, and then we said, will it result in inflows? Well, the reason why we bought inventory is to sell. And uh, when we sell, we tend to make a profit. We tend to make uh, money, you see? And so, and so, um, so yes, it meets the definition of an asset, we've said. And then we said, you know, uh, in most entities, inventory is bought with the purpose of resale within the next 12 months. So, no, so in most entities, they're not buying it for long-term resale. So they're not buying it, hoping to, to resell it in, you know, three or four years time. Most entities are wanting to try and convert that inventory into cash as quickly as possible, right? So, so as a result, we said um, it's current, right? So it's a current asset. And um, I don't want you to worry about situations where um, someone has bought inventory and keeps it for an extended period of time. Uh, it's not really within the scope of our lectures. Um, it's not It's not sort of what we're going to be uh, focusing on. Um, so for our purposes, inventory will always be uh, a current asset, right? Inventory is always going to be a current asset, um, and we're not going to get into that argument of um, whether it's a current or non-current asset. And you see in your textbook, they go deep into the argument. So you can read through that for for your information, but there's no need there's no need to study that um, in detail. Okay, um, the next thing that we chatted about was perpetual and uh, periodic inventory systems, right? So the next thing we spoke about was inventory systems, uh, and remember we said periodic inventory system means that the uh, inventory balance is correct only at a point in time, right? So at a period, at a point in time, it's correct. Whereas with the perpetual inventory system, it is always correct. So from one day to the next, it's always um, correct, you see? And so what does that mean? That means that if we want to identify um, theft, stock theft, so if we want to identify someone stealing our stock, which is the best system? The best system is going to be the perpetual inventory system. Okay, why? Because we've always got a balance of what is um, on hand. Uh, we've always got a theoretical balance to go back to. So we can all, at any time, we can look at our, our accounts, our GL account and say, okay, we're supposed to have this many um, rands of inventory on hand. Let's go and count it and see if it matches up. And obviously if it doesn't match up, then that means either someone has stolen it or someone has put uh, inventory into the storeroom or into the storehouse and didn't tell us or something like that, right? So, so, so the perpetual inventory system is the best system to detect stock movements and stock theft, okay? Everybody still with me? Um, okay. Okay, cool. Right. Now, the next thing we started speaking about was objective two, right? And so objective two, we, we're going to go back uh, and have a look at some of the slides that we went over. 
an objective too, right? So remember, we started off by speaking about um, purchase costs, yeah? So we, we started off speaking about purchase costs. We said purchase costs um, or, or initial costs are made up of three things. What are those three things? We said it's the purchase price. We said non-reclaimable or, 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 or unreclaimable um, taxes, yes? And then um, uh, transport inbound, right? And so let's just talk about them individually. So purchase price, I think, is simple. We don't need to explain that. The, the price that we paid, obviously, is going to is going to be part of cost. Uh, Non-reclaimable taxes. Um, so non-reclaimable taxes are those taxes that we cannot get back from SARS, right? And so that's why we excluded um, VAT. Remember, we said VAT must be excluded because VAT can be claimed back via via um, the we can claim the input vat uh, back when we charge output vat right so when we charge output vat we're going to net the input vat off and we pay sars the net so so in in a sense we are claiming back that input vat um, there right and then um, what, what was the story around transport inbound remember we said we want to include our transport inbound because um, it is a cost that is incurred in making a product or a good sellable, right? Remember that principle. Can you guys remember that principle? It's a, it's a cost. All costs that are incurred in making a good sellable must be included in inventory account, right? So that's, so that's the key. So we said uh, the transport to bring the goods to our factory, right? The transport to bring the goods to our factory is a cost that is involved in making the 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 good sellable. However, the cost to transport the goods to our customer, right, is not a cost that is incurred in making a good sellable. Why why are we saying that? Because we've already we were able to sell it without delivering it. Right, so so we're able to sell it. We're able to sell it to the client before it had been delivered to the client, which then means that it wasn't a cost that was incurred in making it, uh, uh, getting it into a condition that is sellable. Right. So remember that uh, transport outbound or transport to our customer is not included, whereas transport to our factory is included. Okay. Um, and then when we spoke about when we spoke about uh, purchase costs and we, when we said, oh, we're not going to include any sort of overheads, administrative overheads. However, if we added the word factory there, um, if we added the word factory, then it would be considered a manufacturing overhead, right? So we won't add um, any administrative overheads if they relate to the finance department, if they relate to the HR department, et cetera. But if there are costs that relate to the factory and the administration of, of, of the factory or any sort of manufacturing, then they would be included, right? We also said that we're going to exclude any discounts and volume rebates and then forex gains and losses, right? Um, we're going to speak about storage costs uh, and, and abnormal waste a little bit later, so I'm not going to cover it now. And then just remember what our our what what we said we said at transaction date or at acquisition date how do we recognize our um, how would we recognize uh, our inventory it would be net of any potential discount right net of any potential discount remember that net of any potential discount so then i've got a question for you right so you bought inventory and the listing price or the contract price was 100 rand. You were offered um, a discount of 20 rand, right? Um, unfortunately, you were not able to get that discount, right? You, you didn't get that discount. But my question is, what was the cost of inventory at transaction date? Your answer is going to pop up in the chat now. So what would you have recorded this situation at, at transaction date? What would it have been at transaction date? Right. Can you see that? It would have been 80 Rand at transaction date, right? So at transaction date, you are not aware, 
right? You're not aware that you're not going to be able to get the discount because it's a settlement discount. So you only know that you didn't didn't get the discount um, on the settlement date. You see, so at transaction date, you have to measure it net or, or less of the potential discount. And even though later on you never uh, received the discount it's not going to change how you recorded it at transaction date yes at settlement date you will add back the 20. so at the end of it at the end of the settlement date your 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 inventory will be at 100 but at transaction date it's going to be at 80. everyone understand everyone on the same page with me or are you lost Okay, so it seems like everyone everyone's on the same page. So you might get a question like that, similar to that one, um, when you do your concept uh, test. And then remember the guy from 2004, right? Everyone, can everyone remember this guy from 2004 with his flip phone? There's the flip phone there. Um, he said that on page 675, we must not do option one, right? We must never do option one. So never ever are you gonna pass journal entries in line with option one. We will always do option two in back 200. Okay, we'll always do option two. Okay, so that was settlement discount. Um, we then went on to discuss very briefly um, about the foreign supplier. And we said that uh, with, with uh, Forex, for the foreign currency transaction, we want to record the um, inventory, right, at, a, at the RAND amount, which relates to the spot rate, right? So we want to convert it on the spot rate of the transaction date, which means when we read our uh, example, right, you guys will remember this example. When we read the example, we said, oh, okay, the transaction date is this date. So this is the amount we must use to translate the inventory, right? So we always translate inventory on the rate or the foreign exchange rate uh, at transaction date, okay? Everyone everyone okay with that? Okay, so that was, um, um, if anyone's lost, then please, it means that you need to consult, right? If, if you don't understand where we at, it means that we need to consult. So that was, uh, is this the right, let me just go to the right slide. So, so, so far what we've done is we did uh, purchase costs, right? Now let's just talk a little bit about conversion costs. Um, we, just wanted, we just wanna look at the conversion costs. So when we looked at conversion costs, we said, uh, and, you, and you guys would remember this diagram that we pulled out of the textbook. We said that we can have different types of conversion costs. We can have variable costs such as direct labor and um, variable manufacturing overheads. We did not spend a lot of time on these two variable costs, right? We didn't spend lots of time on them because we said it's very easy to allocate it to, to inventory. Uh, why? Because we allocate actual to actual. We allocate the actual cost incurred to the actual goods produced, right? So, so, so that was very easy, right? And, and so we didn't, we didn't spend lots of time on it. The thing that we spent a lot of time on and we went back and forth on was this fixed production overheads or fixed manufacturing overheads cost, right? And so you, you'll you remember the slide that I showed you guys where I summarized it nicely and I said, this is a nice slide for you guys to look at. So we said the variable costs are okay. They, they, they're easy to allocate because we do actuals uh, of costs so actual RAND amounts to actual capacity, right? or actual goods produced, and that's easy for us to arrive at the amount that we need to uh, record. Uh, the problem was the fixed production overheads, and we said with the fixed production overheads, we're going to take the cost, right, which is a random amount, and we're going to come up with this thing called a best estimate, right, of capacity, and we said that's called normal capacity, and remember, normal capacity is always disclosed in what, 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 uh, do we use? We use units. So it's units of production, right? So units of production is what we use uh, when we're talking about uh, when we talk about normal capacity. And so we said we're going to take the rand amount and we're going to divide it by the normal units of production. 
and then we'll take whatever rate, and we call this rate an allocation rate. Everyone remember that? We call it an allocation rate. The textbook calls it an absorption rate. Um, uh, and so and so we take this rate and we multiply it by what actually happens, right? What the actual production is, right? And then you'll remember that we had that discussion where we said, as a result of the fact that you know these numbers are estimates, we may have a situation where the amount that is incurred is different from the amount that is actually allocated to the goods. And that can lead to an over or under recovery. And then remember, we said for back to 100, we're going to keep it as simple as possible. And we're going to take that over and under recovery directly to cost of sales, right? We're not going to, so your textbook goes into detail about what happens when you've got uh, goods on hand at the end of the year and whatnot. We're not going to worry about all of that. We're taking it directly to cost of sales, right? So we're going to do a very simple journal entry, and that journal entry will always be um, one of the contra accounts will be will be um, uh, production overheads, and the other one will be cost of sales. It's going to depend whether it's a debit or credit based on whether it's an over or under production, right? And remember, if it's over production, we want to decrease cost of sales, we credit it. If it's under production, or uh, sorry, under recovery, then we're going to uh, want to increase cost of sales, so we'll debit it, right? And so uh, that's what we said there, and then we summarized everything in this last uh, slide where we said it's easy now for us to identify it's, if it's an over or under recovery, and we look at the capacity that we're given in the question, right? Um, what is the relationship between capacity? Okay, so, so we're still doing our recap. Everyone's still okay? Um, if anyone's lost, just put up your hand. Um, we're going to continue with our recap now. Uh, and uh, we, the next part of the cost that we had to compile was other costs. And we said in other costs, um, we can have any sort of costs that relate to, to customization of the goods, right? And we said, if there's a specific client that we have to customize it to, um, and we need to do something specific for our client that we want to include that cost, because that would be a cost that makes this product uh, sellable, right? So, so, so that's why we're including it. And then we said, uh, with regard to storage costs, right? Um, with regard to storage costs, we can have a situation where storage cost is part of the production process. And our example there was uh, wine or uh, alcohol. And we said we can't produce alcohol if we don't store it for a period of time. And so, as a result. As the, that cost that relates to the storage will be included in the in the um, in the value of inventory, right? And then and then when we spoke about things that we must exclude, we said we must exclude abnormal losses, whether that be materials or labor. We exclude abnormal losses, and and you and you'll see later on that these abnormal losses are added to cost of sales, but they're taken out of inventory, right? So they're taken out of the inventory value but they're added to the cost of sales, right? And so we exclude abnormal losses. We exclude any sort of administration that's non-manufacturing or non-production. Um, if there's just storage costs, but those storage costs are not necessary, or if they are at the beginning or the end of production, right? Remember that trick? If they're at the beginning of production, that means they are not part of the production process. And if they're at the end of the production process, that means also they're not part of the production process, so they will not be included, right? So they have to be within the production process in order for them to be included. And then also selling costs, we're not going to include. Okay. Um, any questions so far about what we've been discussing? Everyone still okay? Um, okay. Please explain borrowing costs. We said that we're not going in depth with borrowing costs, right? So we don't need to focus a lot on borrowing costs. You can read through it, but it's not going to be um, coming out in a big way in your in your paper. There's in fact a different uh, borrowing cost is a different topic, and so because you haven't done that topic, you can expect not to see it. Okay, so that was other costs, right? So so far we did conversion, we did purchase, we did other costs, and then we went to uh, this thing called FIFO weighted average and specific identification. And we said those sections are 
self-study sections. We said we don't, we wouldn't expect to see a major question coming out in our tests and exams, but we might get something small in our concept tests, okay? Um, so, so then let's talk about net realizable value, which is an important topic, right? So net realizable value we did the last time, and we said the key with net realizable value is we want to record um, uh, we want to record inventory at the lower of net realizable value or cost, right? That was the rule. That was the um, I'm just trying to look for it here. There's it here. So it's the lower of cost or net realizable value. It's okay because already cost. Uh, inventory would already be recorded at cost. That was what we were doing so long with, with conversion costs and other costs and whatnot. So we were kind of trying to compile that cost. And so now the only thing we need to calculate is this other uh, thing called net realizable value. All right. And so how did we go about calculating net realizable value? We said we want to come up with uh, expected or uh, estimated selling price. We then want to remove the cost to complete and any costs that relate to selling or, or, se or sales, right? So there's two things that we remove, cost to complete and cost to sell, um, uh, and we remove that from the expected selling price, okay? And remember also that we said that um, net realizable value is entity specific, so different entities might come up with different amounts, and also that net realizable value, you guys would remember this slide with the little coffee mug, uh, net realizable value because it's entity specific it then therefore needs to take into account the purpose for why we holding um, uh, the purpose for why we are holding the inventory so if we're holding the inventory for a specific customer right that and we have a binding sales agreement with that specific customer then we would take that contract price into account when calculating the net realizable value, right? And that was the difference between fair value and net realizable value. Net realizable value, we are looking specifically at our entity and specifically at the inventory that we are dealing with. And, and, and we do it on an inventory by inventory basis. So we don't look at it as a group. We look at the specific reasons for why we're holding each unit of inventory. Um, uh, and and, and who, who we plan to sell it to. And then just remember, Guys, this golden rule, it must be the lower of cost or net realizable value, okay? Everyone slow with me. Everyone on track? Everyone slow with me? Can, uh, so someone said, should we include inventory being held for a customer in net realizable value? Yes, yeah, so when you're doing the calculation, so if we're holding inventory for a specific selling contract, right? So we're selling it to a specific customer, right? But it's in our on our premises and risks and rewards have not transferred at the end of the year, then we would take into account that contract when calculating the net realizable value, right? We would take into account that contract and we'd say, okay, we've got 100,000 units on hand, but 10 of those units, we've already got a contract with someone they haven't paid us, so risks and rewards haven't transferred, but um, there is a binding contract in place. So when, we, when we're calculating it, we'll calculate the 90,000 um, um, using the normal system, and then that, that 10,000 or however many thousand we're keeping for the customer would use the contract price, right? Because we do it specific on specific units as opposed to as a, a bunch. We don't, we don't look at it as a bunch, we look at it as specific. Okay, so that was net realizable value, right? And remember the key behind net realizable value was so that we don't overstate, right? We don't have a situation where we've overstated the cost of inventory, right? So that's why we, we spoke about net realizable value. Okay, uh, any other questions about our recap? Okay. Um, okay. So, so then uh, it seems like uh, everyone's um, okay with what we did. So now we're going to go on to the last objective. So, what's that last objective? 
that last objective is disclosure, right? So now we're going to do disclosure and presentation on inventory. Okay, so the things that we need to look out for, the things that we're going to do is we're going to speak a little bit about the accounting policy today, right? And we're going to look at specific things that are and then are, that are not in the accounting policy. Um, uh, and we're going to do that today. Then we want to have a look at the statement of financial position and look at what needs to be disclosed on that statement. Um, and then that statement has a note that relates to inventories, right? And so we look at that note that relates to inventories. Um, then we're going to look at the statement of profit and loss and other comprehensive income. Um, and then that statement also has a note that relates to inventories. And so we look at that note. So we'll do it. We'll do it like that, and we'll look at those things in that order. Okay. So first, we'll start off by looking at our um, by looking at our uh, uh, accounting policy note. Okay. So the accounting policy note um, is is firstly something that everyone forgets when when they're asked to do disclosure. Um, but but the standard says that we only need to uh, remember to disclose two things on the accounting policy note, right? So at a minimum, two things need to be on the accounting policy note. So what are these things? The first is that we need to indicate the measurement of inventory. But, but remember, this is not a, uh, we don't have a choice here, guys. We don't have a choice about how we measure inventory. We are told that we need to measure inventory at the lower of cost or net realizable value. That's what we were told by the standard. So in fact, the standard wants us to do what? To regurgitate what it has already told us, right? So we just need to have a statement saying that we followed, um, we followed um, the, the system of, of, of measuring cost that uh, at least at measuring inventory that was indicated by the standard, right? And so we need to have our inventory measured at the lower of cost or net realizable value. It then says that we must indicate which formula we've used from the three formulae that, that are offered by the standard, right? So the standard offers the three formulae, FIFO, weighted average, um, specific identification. And so it says you must indicate which one of these you've used in the valuation of your inventory. Um, so, so guys, when we have a look now at our, at our map, right? So, so this is our map, this is our recap that we just did. What is not mentioned in the accounting policy? Right? So there's two things that are mentioned. It says we must indicate the measurement of inventory and the formula, uh, formula that is used. So then let's see. So do we, we do we talk about the calculation of cost? Yes, we would have, we would uh, mention that because that's um, sitting um, here, right? So I'm just going to change my color, um, so that's uh, sitting here, right? So that's where cost is coming from, right? Okay, good. Then um, so 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 it, we we've taken care of objective one. Then it talks about we must mention. Uh, which formula we're using. So that takes care of objective two, right? So there's it there, there's it there. It's asking us which formula we've, that takes care of objective two. And then, um, and then it says, oh, you need to mention if it's lower of cost or net realizable value. So in fact, that first statement takes care of both two and four. So which thing, all right? is missing. What are we not telling them? Right? And think about sort of what I told you was self-study. We're not telling them what? Your answer in the chat, what do you think we're not telling them about in our accounting policy note? That's it. We're not telling them whether we're using the periodic or perpetual inventory system. Has everyone noticed that? The, 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 the note is silent on the system that is being used. Can you see that? The note doesn't mention anything about what inventory system you're using. It mentions the formulae, it mentions the measurement, but it doesn't talk about whether we're doing periodic or perpetual. Okay, everyone understand? 
right? Everyone on the same page? Right. So, so that's very interesting. And the question is, why do you think that's happening? Why, why aren't we being asked to indicate what uh, uh, inventory system we're using? Um, we're not being asked, right? We're not being asked because the understanding being that, so this is called big IFRS, right? So, so you, I don't know if you guys know, but there's two types of IFRS. There's big IFRS, which is what we study in BAC 200. And then there's another thing called IFRS for SMEs or, or standards for SMEs, for small companies, right? And so even though we are told about the periodic system in the standard, the standard assumes that because you're applying big IFRS, right, you will not be using the periodic system. You're going to be using the perpetual system. And that's why you remember at the beginning of the lectures, I said to you, um, you know, going forward in second year and third year, you're not going to see the periodic system again, right? That, that was sort of a first year in high school uh, topic, right? Uh, and, and now um, you mainly are going to be seeing perpetual inventory systems. So, so as a result, the, the uh, accounting policy note is actually silent. It doesn't mention it uh, because they assume that if the company is big enough to apply big IFRS, they must be uh, having the perpetual inventory system. Okay. So that's just an interesting tidbit that you guys can, can think about. Uh, and you might get, uh, you know, you might get a concept question, a concept test question on that anyway. Okay, so now uh, let's uh, chat about the statement of financial position, guys. Okay, so, oops, no, that's the wrong slide. Uh, I want to talk about the statement of financial position. Yes, it's here. So if we have a look at the statement of financial position, um, the standard indicates that we must have inventories, right? And remember, we said for back to hundreds purposes, it will always be under... Um, it will always be under current assets, right? So we're happy with that. Um, we must have inventory, uh, and then we must disclose inventory in the current year and in the prior year. So there must be comparatives, right? And so and so that's important, right? And also, we're going to talk about this note. So so this is a very simple disclosure. It's just going to be a one-line disclosure uh, there. Notice that um, on the face of the income statement, um, it is not broken up by category right when i say category what am i talking about someone type in the chat a category of inventory just give me one category of inventory any category that comes to mind there we go raw materials finished goods the last one that we didn't mention was work in progress right um and then and then you also got consumables so so um Notice that it's not it's not um, broken up by category on the face of the income statement, uh, face of the uh, balance sheet. Can you see that? So, so we're just giving them one one item, and then we expect the user of the financial statement to go to the note. You see? So let's let us go to the note. Let's us have a look at what the note looks like. Right. So in the note, we're going to see that we're going to have raw material. So it's going to be broken up, you see. So it's broken up now in this note. And this is called an inventory note, right? Inventory is note. Uh, don't get it confused with the other note that we're going to do just now. Right. So in the inventory note, we've got raw materials. We're going to have our work in progress. We're going to have our finished goods. Uh, and now if we're dealing with the retail, in, remember when we first started speaking about inventory, we said we get different types of um, uh, businesses. We get retail businesses, which buy finished goods, goods that are already uh, in, a, in a finalized state, and they resell it. And we said those are like our checkers um, and macro and shop right and that sort of stuff. They buy goods that are already finished. They're already, the manufacturing is done. Right, and so they in in those entities you will only have finished goods. You wouldn't have raw materials. You wouldn't have work in progress, and that's because they're not manufacturing. Everyone happy? So 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 um, so anyway, you'll have your your raw materials. You'll have your work in progress, and then you'll have your finished goods, and then you you will have consumables. <clears throat> consumables are going to be sort of. 
uh, uh, things that are used in production. And notice now that this amount that we find here, the total, right, has to agree back to the, what does it have to agree back? Has to agree back to our balance sheet. Everyone happy? So these two amounts are the ones that we see in the note. Where do overheads go? Okay, sorry about that. So where do overheads go? Overheads will be included in what does everyone think? Where would overheads be included? That's it. Overheads will be included in whoop. Okay, overheads will be included when we are calculating whoop or when we are counting for whoop. And so overheads will be going in there. Labor will be going in there. Raw materials will be coming out of there and going in there. Um, and so and so a whoop is, is, is going to be that account that's going to grab the overheads going to grab the variable overheads, going to grab the labor, going to take the, the raw materials and put it all together, right? And do something with it, and then it becomes a finished good, right? So that's where overheads is going to go. Okay, now I want to mention the statement here at the bottom, right? This is very, 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 very important, right? So in the year that you have a write down, right? So in the year that you have a write down of inventory, you must have a little spiel there, a little story, right? You've got a little story there. And what is that story going to tell us? There's, there's a few things that the story needs to tell us. The first is it needs to give us a brief reason for the write down. So in this example, we say, oh, there's a new technology that has come onto the market, right? You can also say, oh, there's a, there's a flood or there's a natural disaster that has happened. Uh, you can say that there was uh, worker negligence that that resulted in damaged stock or whatever it can be right I'm, I, I, it depends on the question um, so so you need to indicate a brief reason for why the write down was there you then need to also indicate the amount and then the date that the write down has has occurred okay everyone happy the spiel has to be there because it attracts marks Okay, this little story, you have to write your little story because it attracts a mark. So if you don't write it, you're going to automatically be limiting yourself in terms of the marks um, that, that you could have gotten. Okay. Okay. Um, then in other situations, they say that you must indicate, you know, if there's any um, uh, inventory that's held for someone else. Uh, any inventory that is uh, belongs to the bank or belongs to someone else, held for security, etc. Um, you can do that, but in Back 200, we're not really focusing on those topics. But however, we are focusing on write downs, right? So we are focusing on write downs. So you should be expecting to write this sort of statement out somewhere. Okay. Any questions so far on disclosure? Any questions about what we're talking about? Everyone know where we are, right? Okay, let's go back now to our plan. And we said, okay, so, so far we've done a, a balance sheet, we've done the note. Now we want to quickly look at the income statement and the note that relates to that. So the, in, in the income statement, we're gonna have this um, cost of sales, right? And in the cost of sales, there's going to be a number of costs that are going to be included. So the first and most obvious cost is going to be the cost of the inventory sold, right? That's going to be the most obvious cost that is there. What else is sitting there? Who else knows? What else is sitting in, in that? Right? No, not write down. We're going to speak about write down just now, right? It's going to be, for example, our over under recovery. Right, our over or under recovery will be there, right? And then we can also have any abnormal wastage, right? So if we we would have taken that abnormal wastage out of our our inventory balance, and we would then add it to our cost of sales, okay? Because it was a cost that we incurred to sell the product. Notice inventory is a cost incurred to make the product sellable. Whereas cost of sales is a cost incurred to sell the product. So they're, they're looking at different stages of the selling process. One is looking at 
is it possible that we can sell it, right? right? That's inventory. Is it possible that we can sell it? Whereas cost of sales is, has it been sold? What were the costs incurred to get it sold, to make it sold, right? And so things like abnormal wastage and such would be included in cost of sales. Um, okay, and now let's talk about the write down. All right, so, so you're going to see on page 714 of your textbook, there's a big story about whether we should be including write downs or what does production overheads, it stands for production overheads. Um, um, so you will see, so PO stands for production overheads. You will see that in your textbook on page 714, there's a big spiel, a big story about um, whether we should be including the write down in, in cost of sales or not, right? Whether we should be including the write down in cost of sales or not. And now the idea being, and the idea behind it is that certain products, um, write downs are, are linked to that product. Right? They're linked, they, they, they're part of selling that product, they're part of holding that product. You should expect write downs. Let's talk about let's talk about a product like that. Can you can everybody think of, for example, a perishable, let's say fruits, right? Um, does it make sense that if you are a company that is selling large amounts of fruits, that they are it's likely that there's going to be um, fruits that will get damaged, right? Fruits will be damaged. There will be some fruits that will spoil and go bad. Um, and so it's part of your business, right? Can everyone see that link? That the, the, the selling of fruits um, um, means that it is likely that you're going to have a write down due to damage, right? So can you understand that, right? Um, but now the, the next thing I want to ask you is if you are selling, uh, 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 let's say, um, uh, bricks, right? You know, bricks that you use to build a building. Is it, can you say, oh, you know, inherent in the nature of bricks is that it, bricks will spoil and bricks will get damaged and bricks will, and the answer is no, they're not supposed to get damaged, right? Um, they, it's not, it's not part of the, of the, of the transportation, uh, uh, um, system that they get damaged right if they're damaged it's damaged because of an accident or because someone was negligent it's not damaged because that's just how they are right it's not damaged because that's just how they, they they spoil so for example some of the examples that we have and now you are going to tell me whether we should include this so i just want a yes or no right in in the chat box should we be including a write down that is uh, as a result of a flood so let's say we are selling computers and we have a flood in our warehouse. Should we include that write down in cost of sales? Should we include that write down in cost of sales? So the question you need to ask yourself is, is it inherent right, to selling laptops that we should expect floods? Is it inherent? Is it something that is logical that whenever whoever is selling laptops, they should always get a flood in their in their warehouse, and the answer is no. That doesn't make sense, and therefore we would say in that situation we can't include the write down in cost of sales, right? It must be included in other expenses, right? So in this account called other expenses, okay? And so that's that's the uh, discussion. So how would you know in your test and exam whether to include it in cost of sales or not? you will be told that, for example, given the nature of the products, right, and this I'm sort of quoting a, te a prior test and exam, it, it says, given the nature of the products, um, the entity should expect write-downs um, uh, um, uh, write in inventory, right? And so then you will, you, when you read that statement in your, in your um, test or exam, then you know, oh, now I need to include this write-down in cost of sales. Right. But for example, if we're selling laptops and we have a flood, then it's not really it's not really something we'll include in cost of sales. OK. And then so let's quickly have a look at the note that relates to this. And so the note is going to be the profit before tax note. OK. The profit before tax note. 
And in that profit before tax note, we're just going to break down whatever is sitting in other expenses or other income. That's basically what we're doing here, right? So it's going to include everything except revenue and cost of sales. And we're just going to break it down because what, what we'll often see is there'll be a large number of accounts that are aggregated that are put together and put into other expenses and and or other income and so in this note we just break it down and we state it individually and so we'd say there's a write down and the write down is for this amount uh, that's basically what what um what it means right and that's basically what what we're looking for okay so we've got a few more minutes let's do an example okay everyone up for an example okay let's do an example okay so we're looking at this uh, company that manufactures catering equipment right it says the manufacturing plant transfers finished goods to the warehouse at cost okay um at the end of the reporting period which is the 29th of february 2016 the following inventories were on hand right and so they give us the three categories right three categories of inventory We've got uh, raw materials, we've got work in progress, we've got finished goods. Happy? Okay. So now it says, um, it was established that the cost of certain finished goods held in the warehouse were damaged due to a leak in the roof and had to be impaired. Okay, good. So now everybody knows what catering equipment is. It's like equipment that you use to cook something, right? Or to serve something. It's normally used by restaurants, right? That type of equipment. So now there's a leak in the roof. Can you see that? There's a leak in the roof of the warehouse and it was impaired. So my, my question to you is, if there's a write down as a result of this leak in the roof, would you include that in cost of sales? You're going to say yes or no for me in the chat. Would this write down be included in cost of sales? Yes or no in the chat. Right? There we go. Everyone is saying no. Why? Because the nature of the catering equipment, right, is not one that will result in a leak in the roof. So it's not part of their normal business. Does that make sense to you? Leaking a leaking roof is not part of the normal business of catering equipment. Um, and so and so you need to ask yourself, you know, is this right? Should we be expecting this write down in the normal course of business? Yes, for vegetables, you should be expecting spoilage, right? For, for, for fresh fruits and vegetables, you should be expecting spoilage because that's the nature of the product that we're buying, right? Um, and for example, meat and that sort of stuff, there will be a small amount of spoilage in those types of goods, in the, given the, because of the nature of the good. But here with catering equipment, the nature of the catering equipment does not lead to leaky roofs, right? So, so this would be a write down that is not included in cost of sales. Okay, so anyway, it says the original cost for the impaired goods is 250,000 which means that not all the goods were impaired. How do we know not all the goods were impaired? Because we're told that at year end, they got a hundred, uh, sorry, a million, um, one million, 256 uh, rand. So they've got quite a lot of uh, finished goods there, but only 250 were affected. Can you see that not all of it was affected, all right? Um, and then it says, the, the selling value for the damaged goods is estimated to be 80,000 Rand and the, co the cost to sell the damaged goods is 5,000 Rand. So what is this testing? Put, 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 um, put your answer in the, in the chat there. It's testing something that we learned. Um, what is it testing? That's it. It's testing our our understanding of NRV, right? So can you see that, that it's testing our understanding of NRV in the question, right? So all inventories are valued with the first in, first out method of valuation. Okay, happy. Okay, good. Now, now let's just do a little bit of work on this NRV, right? So if we were to calculate the NRV, we'd have to start off with the expected um, selling price. What's the expected selling price? 80,000. Right? Everybody knows where I got the 80,000 from, right? So the expected selling price is 80,000, right? And now what do we need to remove? We need to remove two things. First thing is cost to complete, 
right? What's the cost to complete here? What is the cost to complete? Wait, wait, no, 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 not 5,000. The cost to complete is zero. How do we know the cost to complete is zero? Is because it's already a finished good. So there's no need, there's no remaining manufacturing that needs to be done, right? So cost to complete is zero, right? So what else do we need to remove? We need to remove cost to sell. So now what's the cost to sell? Now it's 5,000. Yes, cost to sell is 5,000 not the cost to complete. So cost to sell is 5,000, right? And we're gonna put that in brackets. Brackets mean minus, right? Everyone knows that. So what's our NRV amount? NRV amount is 75,000. Everyone happy? Does everyone know how I got to the 75,000? Do you understand the rationale behind it, right? understand why we got there right okay so then we need to say to ourselves okay now out of this 1,250,857 um, there's about 1 million uh, finished goods that are undamaged right because we're only told 250,000 was affected so the rest of it was undamaged right so this is the amount that is undamaged. Okay, so let's have a look now at, at the required. The required says, can we determine the value for finished goods, right, to be disclosed in the notes of the financial statements? How would we go about doing this? We would take the undamaged value of 1,856,000, rand, right? And uh, someone said, so cost of damaged goods and are we yes oh yes good good we should we should actually discuss this so the cost is 250 the nrv is 75 so we need to do what we need to write it down happy we need to write down the inventory and how much are we going to write it down by we're going to write it down by what how would we calculate that 250 minus 75, what is the amount we need to write it down by? 175, okay. Yeah, so we need to write it down by 175. Okay, so back to the to the required, it's, it says that we must come up with a value for finished goods. So we're gonna add the 1 million to the 75, and that is gonna give us the value of finished goods. Let's have a look at what they've done. They've done it slightly differently. What they've done is they've taken the total value that we were given in the question, and they minus the write down amount of uh, 175, and that gave them the amount of 1,075,856, which is the same amount that we would have come to if we had just added that 1 million of remaining um, uh, undamaged uh, finished goods to the 75. Everyone happy? Everyone happy? Okay. Now they tell us calculate the accounting, uh, uh, write out the accounting policy. What? Let's go back to our slide. What do we need to have in the accounting policy? Just as a reminder, we need two things. We need the measurement of inventory and we need the cost formula. So let's go and have a look and see if, if that's what they've got there. Yes, so they say the inventory is measured at the lower of cost. And then they say estimated selling value, less cost to complete and cost to sell, right? So, so what, th this is, a, is, an, is the expanded version of NRV. Can you see that? They've written it out in detail, right? And then they say the first, in first out method of valuation is used. So now notice the marks that are allocated. We get one mark for saying accounting policy, sorry, half a mark at least for saying accounting policy, half a mark for saying inventories, and then we get one mark for having the correct uh, measurement and one mark for having the correct, um, do we have to write it out in detail? Yes, you have to. 
if you want the marks, you have to write it out in detail. All right, and then you say um, first in, first out method, and you also get, um, can we just say NRV? You can say net realizable value. I wouldn't just say NRV. You can say net lower of cost and net realizable value. Not, I wouldn't use the abbreviation because then you'll lose marks for using the abbreviation. Because remember, you're writing this for the users of financial statements. You're not, you must think, I'm not writing this for a test. I'm writing this for the users of financial statements. So then you wouldn't use abbreviations. Okay. So we're almost finished. I know we're a little bit over time, but we're almost done. So then it says, um, let's present the inventories on the face of the, of the um, statement of financial position. But now remember, when we're doing that, we need to know what the note looks like, right? So we need to calculate the note anyway. So let's read what requirement four says. Requirement four says prepare the disclosure note for inventory. So in, 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 uh, in fact, what we should do is we should start with requirement four and then do a requirement three, right? Everyone happy and understand why we're doing that? Because we need the total amount, okay? Everyone knows why we're doing that. We need the total amount, right? So let's start with that and see how, how that goes. So they say raw materials, work in progress, finished goods. That we got directly from the question. Um, the first amount we also got directly from the question as well as the second, right? That's directly from the question. Where did we get this from? We got this from required one. Everyone happy? You know where we got the 1,075,000? Right, from required one. Okay. And then we added those three up to give us an amount of 1.5 million for 1,504,375. One, uh, 1, Rand. Okay. And then they tell us, now we go back to number three, Number three says, show it to us in the balance sheet. And then this is what we do. We show it to them in the balance sheet. Uh, this would be a red, uh, red mark here. And so notice we get half a mark for, the, for, the, for having the correct name and the correct date. We get half a mark for saying current assets, half a mark for saying um, inventory. We get half a mark if the note and the note number match our, our um, our note that's to come, and then this amount we get one full mark. But remember, this is a principal mark. So, so, so we get even if our amount is wrong, we need to have copied it correctly to get this mark. You have to have copied your incorrect amount here, and then you'll get the mark. Okay, cool. Okay, guys. So that's so what I've done in this last slide is I've just got a little I've got a list of uh, terms that I want you to think about. So I want you to go home and just sort of revise these terms and make sure that you understand them in detail. It, it's it's use, you should be using it as a learning aid. And then in terms of tutorials or um, homework questions, this question 13.13 13 is very important i want you to do this question in detail okay 13.13 13 is very important you have to do that in detail okay that's all for today folks um and i'm going to stop the